it started viewing the exhibits, um, I think one of our board members, uh, Jay, was looking to say a few things as a welcome. So you can take uh, sure, sure thing. Thank you so much uh, for having me, uh, Mike, and the rest of the team. Um, good evening to everyone out there in the virtual audience. Uh, my name is uh, Jay Nuachu. I am a board member of the Baltimore Museum of Industry. Uh, we're so thrilled uh, to welcome all of you to the second part of this partnership series with our friends at the Reginald F. Lewis Museum of African American History and Culture, and as I refer it, the Lewis. Um, I'm so proud of the work um, of the staff at both museums to continue developing new exhibits and tours, even though our doors have remained closed longer than any of us expected. Um, even though we would, of course, prefer to be able to host you in person for events like these, uh, we are extremely delighted to be able to offer a variety of virtual tours and programs. Thank you for your membership, which provides uh, much needed support to our institutions and enables us to continue to provide programs like these. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity as well to thank our colleagues from the Lewis Museum for partnering with us on this series. I hope that many of you were able to join us for the first program that took place two weeks ago and offered a fascinating look at the Lewis's new exhibit, Freedom Bound, Runaways of the Chesapeake. If not, I encourage you to visit their website where you can learn more about this grand, groundbreaking exhibit. For those of you who are not familiar with the Baltimore Museum of Industry, we're dedicated to telling the stories of the workers and the entrepreneurs who built Baltimore into a manufacturing powerhouse. Our museum is inside a 19th century oyster cannery, and we're located not too far from the Lewis on the south side of Baltimore's Inner Harbor in Lucas Point. We look forward to welcoming members uh, from both museums to the BMI as soon as we are able to open, hopefully later this summer. Uh, it is now my pleasure to turn the program back over to BMI's education coordinator, Mike Heathy. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jay. Um, and again, thanks everyone for joining us. In just a minute, um, I will actually take down the splash screen here and we can uh, get a look at the Baltimore Museum of Industry. In just a minute, we'll be able to go inside and uh, I'll lead a virtual walkthrough of our exhibits. As, the, as hopefully you, you um, saw as you're registering for the program today, the, today's program will be a uh, look at some of the exhibits and artifacts of the museum with a particular focus on black workers in Baltimore's history. Um, the museum's exhibits mostly range from about the mid 1800s to the mid 1900s. So that's a period of about a century that um, the museum mostly focuses on. I'll give a little bit of context at the beginning about the black community in Baltimore heading into that period. But for the most part, we'll be looking at the mid 19th to the mid 20th century. Um, if you haven't visited the museum before, um, this is a view of the outside building. We're located on the south side of Baltimore's Harbor in what used to be an industrial site. As Jay mentioned, it was one of the one of many oyster canneries where people worked every single day. Um, and here is just a great view of our parking lot and above us, if I pan up just a little bit, uh, the bright green crane was used at one of Baltimore's shipyards during World War II to build Liberty ships. So with that, we can head inside the exhibits and actually starting with a view of our lobby here. Um, before we head into our first exhibit, I do want to um, introduce myself. And my name's Mike Keithy. I'm the education coordinator at the Baltimore Museum of Industry. I want to preface today's tour by saying that um, my background is more on the education side and not necessarily uh, an academic historian of um, Baltimore's black communities, but the material that I'll be sharing today is put together based on my knowledge of the museum's archives, its collections, and I'm also relying here on a collaborative research project that the museum staff did to highlight um, underprivileged voices, including uh, black voices and the voices of people of color, and uh, to make those more prominent in our exhibits. So I'm really thankful that I can rely on the rest of the museum staff for some of their expertise as well. As we go through the exhibits, uh, please feel free to drop any questions in the chat. I'll do my best to answer those as we go through. My goal for today is about 45 minutes looking at the objects and um, some of the photos and videos that we have as well. And I'll try to leave a little bit of time for questions at the end. And um, with that, we will head up to look at the oyster canning industry in Baltimore. 
um, our first exhibit, always a special one for our museum. And before I go any further, I do want to make sure that everyone can see the screen well. Hopefully you're seeing um, our exhibit here. Is that coming through for everybody? If I could get a wave on Zoom or a post in the chat. All right, excellent. Yep. Yeah. Um, so as you might notice, heading into our first space here, um, this, is, this space looks a little bit different than the rest of the museum. We're coming into the old wooden floorboards and these white brick walls. This section of the building is the original footprint. Um, the oyster canning factory was built by a man named Mr. Platt in the 1860s. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Platt and the other oyster cannery owners in Baltimore were white. Uh, this was a major industry in Baltimore, the, at one point the second largest industry in terms of the number of factories and the number of workers. Um, but as far as I know, I haven't seen any references to any major canning factories in the city being owned by uh, black businessmen or people of color. There were plenty of employees, particularly in the early part of, this in, of the early uh, part of the canning era that were black though. Uh, particularly in the unskilled work, and I'll be able to talk about some of those in just a minute. For a little bit of that context that I mentioned, uh, Baltimore, what, since its beginnings as an industrial city in the early 1800s, Baltimore had a fairly large uh, black community compared to other cities across the country. In 1830, um, which is kind of a, uh, an era where Baltimore is really getting its footing, coalescing as a major port city, many as about a quarter of the city's population were black. And the majority of those were free. Baltimore had a very large free black population, but a sizable portion of Baltimore's population was also enslaved. Um, as we go through the museum, I always like to challenge visitors to be thinking about industry and work to mean more than just what we think of today as nine to five jobs and um, kind of traditional contract labor. Uh, looking at Baltimore's black community, that means looking at people who were, uh, maybe didn't have access to steady employment that others in the city may have had, and even for Baltimore's earliest era, looking at workers who didn't choose their vocation or their life, um, uh, people whose enslaved status was forced upon them, and the work that they were doing um, shaped really their entire life and context in the city. Unlike the southern plantations in uh, outside of Baltimore, and, and particularly in states further south by the 1800s, um, the enslaved population in Baltimore would probably not have been primarily agricultural workers. They would have been doing things like uh, their masters might have been renting them out to, um, to work at the docks. There was a large population of shipbuilders who were enslaved and in other trades professions as well. So really diverse community, both among the enslaved population and the free blacks. Uh, as I mentioned before, Balt the history that we focus in the Museum of Industry primarily starts in the 1860s and moves onward. So most of what I'll be talking about today is not going to be focused on Baltimore's enslaved population, but that is, of course, a really key context heading into the type of labor that we are able to talk about here at the museum. So getting back to the oyster canneries, um, the first object that we have here is a dredging net. Um, Baltimore's oysters would have been coming from the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, really, Baltimore as an industrial city and as a city as a whole really owes its existence to the water. First, the Patapsco River, uh, and then just a few miles downriver, the Chesapeake Bay, which allows commerce to, sh to flow in and out of the city and to parts up and down the East Coast and around the world. Um, a lot of Baltimore, or a lot of Maryland's oystermen would have been black or people of color sailing up and down the Chesapeake Bay, either tonging oysters using long tongs uh, for that would have been done in the shallower parts of the water, or using large dredging net like these. Then they would have sailed up the river to Baltimore to unload huge mountains of oysters. And that's really where the story begins for the workers inside of our factory. Um, I have a photo to give just a little bit of context of the scale of this work. Um, as I bring up the photo, I'm curious um, 
in the audience have tried oysters before? You're going to post in the chat, and particularly um, what you think of them. So I know that oysters can be somewhat decise divisive. I see a uh, thumbs up from at least a couple of people. You've tried oysters. Um, and maybe a tougher question, has anyone here ever shucked an oyster? Looks like uh, a couple of people are posting that they do enjoy oysters, um, but only cooked. Yep, I know some people are fans of the, the raw oysters, some uh, only cooked, maybe steamed. Um, so here is a photograph uh, from the Library of Congress's collection uh, showing the outside of one of the canning factories. Um, and you can see this picture was actually taken from one of the Virginia uh, canneries, but the context would have been the same for Baltimore. You can see just a mountain of, of oyster shells uh, behind this worker right here. He might have been uh, using the, the pail to carry them in and out of the factory. It looks like uh, we have, let's see, at least one person in the chat said that their grandmother worked in the oyster cannery and so and spoke about the, the long hours. Yep, uh, the people working in these factories would have been working for 10 or 12 hours a day, uh, six days a week. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, the um, work day was commonly uh, Monday through Friday, Monday through Friday, plus every Saturday, and longer days than we're used to. And we have someone joining whose husband is an oyster shucker now. That's excellent. Um, so you can see the scale of the oysters that have been delivered to the factories. Um, we also have a photograph of a shucking shed where the work would have been done to actually open up the oysters. So here is a photograph. You can see the empty oyster shells starting to pile up at their feet. The workers would have aprons on to protect their clothes from the bay water coming out of the oysters. Um, it's difficult to see. I, I don't think we have any clear examples here, but they probably would have been wearing gloves and they would hold a short knife, a shucking knife, to slide in between the soft spot at the front of the oyster shell, and then give it a twist to pop it open. Uh, this picture comes from the late 19th century, and you might notice that uh, most of the workers here, I believe, are men, although there's, I believe there's at least one woman. Uh, this would have been work that men and women would be doing side by side in a, in a lot of the factories. And pretty much everyone is wearing some kind of headgear, a hat, um, probably uh, more out of fashion than they actually need to uh, protect their heads or their hair. There's a question in the chat, did children work? Yes, and I think that we can see a few examples of certainly younger people. Uh, maybe this one on the end, uh, it's hard to tell exactly, but that could easily be someone at a slightly younger age. But we do know that kids as young as maybe six or seven years old would be working in these factories. So they would start uh, very young. In fact, kids pop possibly even younger than that, even down to toddlers or infants, could be coming to the factories with their parents um, who would keep them by their sides instead of being able to afford childcare. Unskilled work, like shucking the oysters and a lot of the other jobs in the canning factories, filling the cans, gluing labels onto them, those sorts of things. Um, those jobs in the early era, in the 1860s and 70s, um, would have been their unskilled, low-paying jobs, but they um, would commonly be done by uh, black workers in Baltimore. As you start getting into kind of a couple decades later, heading into the 1900s, um, there was kind of a shift in different job opportunities for Baltimore's black workers as more and more of the um, city's population turned to immigrants. Uh, there have always been large immigrant populations in the city, but particularly in the late 1800s and early 1900s, a huge influx of immigrants from Europe began to compete with Baltimore's native black community for low-skilled jobs like these. And in fact, getting back to our exhibit, 
Um, we can see some of the shucking stalls, like we saw in the picture there. Uh, so the workers would have stood on the stalls to get their feet up off the ground and protect their shoes from the bay water. And we can also see some more of those empty oyster shells piling up. As we head around the corner though, we can see um, a great picture of some kids working in the canneries. Um, all of the kids in this picture are white, I believe. Uh, they, they appear to be. This picture was taken in the early 1900s as part of a, a large photography effort by a man named Louis Hine. Uh, he's a somewhat famous photographer who traveled around the country photographing child labor and then um, presenting what he found to Congress. And his work led to some of the first national child labor laws. Um, but at least as far as what I've seen of Hines' collection, um, particularly the photos he took in Baltimore, he was primarily photographing um, white, white children. Um, part of that is the changing demographics of workers on the fields and in the canneries, um, but part of that may also have been um, his choice and part of his mission of, of wanting to gain sympathy among white lawmakers in, in passing child labor laws. If we look closely, we can see that the kids in this picture are not working with oysters. I know it's difficult to tell in uh, just with the photograph I've got here, but looking at the plate on this boy's lap and the box here, um, can anyone see what they might be working with? What food they'll be canning here? And we have in the chat the right answer, green beans, absolutely. Um, so this picture we can tell from a couple of context cues that this picture was taken during the summer. Um, part of the reason why we know that is the green beans. Um, for a couple different reasons, oysters only would have been harvested in the fall, winter, and spring. Uh, you may have heard the rule before, if the months are in the name, are when it's safe to harvest the oysters. Um, and so that gives us, that leaves out months like May, June, July in the summer. So during those months, the factories would switch over to canning fruits and vegetables. And in this case, we see green beans. You can also tell um, that this picture was taken during the summer because of the kids' outfits. Uh, you may notice something that they're not wearing, something that they're missing which is shoes. You can see clearly on the, the couple kids in the front, absolutely a couple of you in the, the chat have mentioned the same thing. Um, the, uh, so the kids that would be working in these factories would uh, almost certainly have been coming from poorer backgrounds. Their parents might be working alongside them in the same factories or uh, potentially unskilled work in other factories as well. There, this picture was taken in the early 1900s, there were certainly schools in Baltimore, um, but for the poorest Baltimoreans, the, they would have had to bring their kids uh, to work with them in order to contribute to the family's income so they could afford everything that they need, um, everything that the family would need to purchase. A couple of great questions in the chat. Uh, somebody asked about the hours that the kids would work. They would be working the same hours as the adults 10 or 12 hours a day, six days a week. So very long hours. They also would have been paid not for the hours they worked or the days, uh, but they would be paid for however much work they did. Uh, so one of the reasons why there was an incentive to bring as many people in your family as you could to work because um, you'd only get paid for the amount of food that you processed. Another great, great question about um, Native American workers in Baltimore. Um, that is... A great question, a large one, um, and unfortunately not one that I'm super prepared to talk about uh, today. Um, but if you did want to reach out to uh, the Museum of Industry through our info, uh, info at the bmi.org uh, question, um, then we could put you in touch with uh, some of our archivists and we can kind of uh, address that more, probably better over email. Um, and Great question about are there detailed employment records? Um, and if so, where are they located? The BMI has collected uh, records from different businesses and companies. So our archives has some employment records. 
Um, I, the Maryland State Archives are large enough that I'm sure you can find plenty of business records there. Um, so there, I don't know of any one kind of central repository where you could look up anything of you, you might want about a given company. Um, they tend to be scattered based on uh, which, which museum or archive might have uh, come into possession of the uh, a, a business's records. Um, and of course, in many cases, businesses might not have thought of their records as historical documents and so wouldn't have saved them. So for the vast majority of people like these kids, like the workers I showed you in the earlier pictures, um, the time that they worked in a factory, um, what their conditions were like, those may not have been recorded unless someone um, felt it was noteworthy and decided to save it. Heading around the corner, we have some of the machines that would be used uh, in the canning factories. This first one here, which I'll zoom in on, trying not to make anyone too dizzy. Uh, this one would be used to fill the cans, a job that would originally have been done by hand in the early factories. Uh, this machine has a flywheel on the side, which would be attached to a, um, would be attached uh, a, sorry, a belt would attach the machine to an engine to power it, and it would move the cans underneath this large uh, copper bin, which is where they would place the oysters, the other food that they were canning, and it would drop just the right amount onto the can, which would slide out over here. Behind me, if I spin around, is uh, one of the most important machines from these factories. This is called a steam retort, and this would be used to cook the cans. Originally, that would have been done uh, basically just in a large pot of water, cooking a handful of cans at a time for a, a long time. It could take hours, and it was very imprecise um, practice. So we're never quite sure if uh, the cans were safe to eat afterwards. This machine was invented in Baltimore, and it, uh, it greatly sped up much safer or reliable cooking the cans. So you can load up these baskets with dozens of cans and lower them down into the machine. It's actually deeper than it looks going all the way down into the basement. They would seal up the machine, pump the chamber full of steam, and the pressure from the steam is what would cook the cans. Uh, in just a couple of minutes doing an entire batch. And here we have a picture of some of the laborers who are loading up the cans. This was a difficult and dangerous job. Not only is it involve um, uh, lifting the baskets using a chain system to lower in, them into the machine, but also if the machines aren't used correctly, there is a potential for um, for the steam to vent or uh, something else might happen that could injure the workers. So definitely a difficult and dangerous job, but a vitally important one in the factories. And behind us, we have another picture of one of the kids who would work in the factory. This is a can boy um, whose job would be to run around the factory bringing the cans where they needed to go. The machine behind him, this large one against the wall, eventually replaced the can boys in our factories, um, as did uh, essentially all of the machines um, that I'm showing you. They allow the, in some cases at least, they allowed the workers to, or sorry, they allowed the owners of the factories to lay off some of their unskilled workers like the can boys. Uh, this is a very simple machine, just meant to deliver the cans to different parts of the factory. You load the cans in at the back, send them up the conveyor belt, and they roll down the track wherever we need them to be. For this one, we actually have a video so you can demonstrate how this machine works. Um, and I will turn the sound on for this video depending on um, what you have your volume set at, uh, uh, depending on what you have your volume set at, it might be a little bit loud. So I wanted to give that warning. Um, 
but this will give you a sense of how loud it would be in the factories um, with not just one, but many machines running all at once. As I said, a very simple machine. Uh, the cans just roll down the track wherever we need them to go. And for now, it's set up in a little loop so it doesn't take up too much space in the museum. But in a real factory, the track will go all the way around the building. So that is a quick look at some of the workers and some of the machines from the canning industry in Baltimore. Um, if you have any questions, um, there's a lot more to talk about, about this industry and about others at the museum. So um, we've had some great questions so far and keep them going, but um, we do have plenty of exhibits that I wanted to highlight on this tour. So I, I, am, I will be moving on to some other industries in just a moment. Um, question we have, I assume some of the cans went flying. Uh, there is a track which meant to keep the cans um, pretty secure and uh, make sure they wind up where they're they're headed, the different stations in the canning factory. Um, what's more of an issue, it's not necessarily that the cans wind up going flying, but if the machine isn't calibrated right, or if the cans aren't the right size, sometimes they will get jammed either on the track or on the conveyor belt. Um, so all of the machines would need to be maintained very carefully um, to prevent jams, to prevent um, the machine being damaged in any of its, its moving parts. Any other questions about um, the canning factories or the people who might have worked here? As I mentioned, this is a, a major industry in Baltimore, at one point the second largest in the city, and there were hundreds of these canning factories, particularly around the harbor. Um, but by the 19 teens and 20s, uh, the oyster population in the Chesapeake Bay really started to decline. Um, and so very quickly, in the span of just a couple years, um, the population of oysters dropped far enough that it, the large-scale canning wasn't really sustainable. Some factories in Baltimore switched over to canning fruits and vegetables all year round, uh, but many more of them went out of business. And so this industry declined uh, pretty quickly um, ahead of a lot of other manufacturing industries in, in the city. Keeping up the theme of... Oh, Oh, a great question. Uh, someone asked what the, the number one industry uh, was in Baltimore, if the oyster industry was number two. Um, that would actually be the garment industry. Around the turn of the century, there were more clothing factories and more workers in those factories than any other type of work in Baltimore. Um, we do have an excellent exhibit about the clothing industry, but um, for time concerns today, that, uh, won't, that isn't something I was planning on. So you can or other tours or come see the museum when it reopens, uh, hopefully in, in a couple, um, hopefully at some point in the next couple of months. Um, and you can, you can learn much more about the clothing industry. Um, someone asked if this was a 24 hour operation. Um, certainly some of the factories in the city, particularly in, in the later era, uh, the mid 1900s would have been working multiple shifts to keep production going 24 hours. Um, Mr. Platt's factory in particular, which is um, the building that went on to eventually become the Baltimore Museum of Industry. I'm not entirely sure of the work schedule for that one, um, but, it, but it's certainly possible that people would have been working there all, all year round. And um, a question about 
uh, blacks working in the canning industry being either native to the city or migrating to it from other parts of the country. Uh, it's entirely possible, particularly as you get into the 19 teens and 20s, uh, which is kind of the, as I said, the declining era of, um, of uh, this industry that um, African Americans coming to the city might have found jobs in the canning industry. Um, in the 1860s, Baltimore, the, the black community in Baltimore had actually uh, gotten relatively small as a, a proportion of the city's overall population, um, partly because that was uh, when kind of the period of European immigration was um, greatly expanding the size of the city overall. But in the decades after the Civil War, there was a large migration of um, black people from states further to the south up to Baltimore. So it's entirely possible that a lot of the cannery workers would have been part of that migration. Keeping up the theme of the food industry, um, I'll be going just around, popping over the weir. Um, we have artifacts and uh, collections from a couple different types of food processing at the museum. You can visit us to see a um, grocery store from the early 1900s, a bakery as well. Um, along the wall here, we have uh, some machines that would be used in the meat packing industry, uh, which was a large one in Baltimore as well. Um, workers in particularly what's, uh, what was eventually known as um, as Pig Town, uh, part of the city with a lot of uh, slaughterhouses where they would have been processing meat. Um, this would have been a large industry. Um, in particular, I wanted to highlight one business owner in Baltimore um, who came from the black community. His name was Henry G. Parks. And some of, particularly maybe uh, the older folks among the audience, if we have any, might remember Parks Sausage, a uh, major Baltimore institution. Um, here is a photograph of Henry Parks. Try to make him a little bit larger for us. Uh, Parks was a businessman. He worked in um, he worked in advertising and sales for a couple different companies before eventually coming to Baltimore in the late 1940s and starting the Parks Sausage Company in 1951. Um, he, it, some of his previous experience was actually doing marketing for the Pabst Beer Company. Um, and he built uh, Park Sausage, which is originally located in a building on Pennsylvania Avenue, for, everyone, for anyone really familiar with Baltimore's uh, streets and neighborhoods. And over the next couple decades, Parks grew to be a major business, a uh, multi-million dollar company with hundreds of employees. Um, looks like we've got folks in the comments who recognize the, some of the advertising. I've got, we've got one of the um, posters on the wall. So here's a close-up view. Some of you might recognize that. More Par Parks Sausage Mom, their slogan at one point. And um, we even have somebody in the chat who uh, had a friend who worked for him, which is great. Um, Parks eventually, the Park Sausage eventually went on to become the first black owned business to be publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange. So one of, one of many little pieces of uh, Baltimore's history being the first in the nation. Parks uh, built his business by really thinking about branding and marketing. He pioneered things like uh, taste testing in grocery stores. So if we Think back to those days many months ago when we were, you know, liked to linger in grocery stores. You might remember um, doing taste tests of different products. Park, Parks was uh, one of the pioneers of that. And also things like uh, getting FDA um, and, and approval at a time when only certain parts of the food industry needed to do that. So Parks was volunteering his company for FDA inspection. Um, he also uh, put... Um, expiration dates and additional information on that. Part of that, I believe, was an awareness of 
um, the fact that it was a black owned company and that it might face resistance trying to enter into what was traditionally thought of as white only markets. Um, Park spoke at one point about resisting any kind of label as a business uh, specifically for black communities and resisted any attempts to only have park sausage sold in certain parts of the city or certain areas. I have one other photo as well from, from parks, uh, which is some of the, the workers um, packaging the products. Uh, Park Sausage was a major it, you know, company, an institution in Baltimore. It eventually closed in, I believe, the 1990s. So I don't believe it's still in existence. Um, but the late representative, Elijah Cummings, uh, wrote at one point about growing up in Baltimore and seeing Park Sausage as um, a symbol for the Black community, a symbol of uh, kind of a real point of inspiration and um, a, a symbol of Black opportunity and achievement. And again, if there are any questions, you're welcome to keep them going in the chat. Um, but keeping conscious of time, I'm actually going to skip ahead to our next exhibit right here. Uh, which is about the metalworking industry in Baltimore. Um, this is the oldest industry that we talk about in our museum. Uh, I'm pretty confident in saying that. Uh, metalworking and blacksmithing has been around for uh, thousands of years. We have a small blacksmith's forge in this side of the room. And when the museum is open, we have a volunteer blacksmith who fortunately donates his time um, to volunteer in the museum on Saturdays and actually fires up the forge. Uh, some of you may have seen blacksmiths working at um, craft shows, at other uh, historical sites or parks. Um, they are very skilled craftsmen who can make all sorts of products out of metal. I have a few examples of some of the things that our volunteer blacksmith has made in our shop. So looking at the right here, uh, we have a bar of iron, um, which would be heated in the forge up to about 2000 degrees. So that's the iron or the steel that the blacksmith works with has to get very hot for it to be uh, workable. Blacksmiths would make simple products like these hooks, More decorative things like the candlestick holder, you can see in the corner. The spiral shape of the candlestick holder means you can spin a peg at the bottom and the candle will actually go up or down inside the holder. And these heart-shaped pieces um, are what's known as uh, trivets. They would be used um, kind of like a heating pad in our kitchens uh, today, anything uh, if you if you take something off the stove or out of the oven and don't want to uh, damage the surface you're putting it on, you put the trivets underneath to protect what might be underneath. This is a, like I said, a very skilled line of work. Uh, it would have taken years of apprenticeship for someone in Baltimore to become a blacksmith. Um, and we do know that there are examples in Baltimore of black um, blacksmiths potentially maybe even relying on skills that people in the black community might have learned while enslaved. Um, there are, uh, there's some great uh, scholarship about enslaved blacksmiths at some of the larger plantation houses in the South. Um, I know that uh, Monticello, um, the historians there have done some, have put out some interesting videos and articles about that. And as, um, as people, uh, received their freedom or stole their freedom or earned it and came north, they might have been bringing their skills as well. Uh, in doing a little bit of reading for today's, uh, for today's program, I came across an article that looked at 100 black workers in the neighborhood of Old Town in the mid-1800s. 
And out of 100 black workers, 10 of them were blacksmiths, which was pretty high for a skilled line of work like this one. Um, I do also want to point out that 18 of those workers, uh, which was the, the largest for any type of work, were laundresses. Um, so a lot of the um, workers that we've been looking at, uh, particularly the, the skilled work, um, we are talking uh, maybe uh, leaning a little bit more towards the story of black men, but of course, uh, black women would have been working in all kinds of, in all lines of work and um, have, you know, economic, seeking economic opportunities of their own within their particular constraints. Um, the era of blacksmiths started to come to an end in the late 1800s and early 1900s as we start to get into um, mass production and the need for interchangeable parts. All of those machines that I was showing you in the cannery, also things like automobiles and other devices, uh, those would need to be made in large scale factories where the parts are exactly the same. And so eventually blacksmiths started to be replaced by machinists instead. And what we have in the other side of the room, hop over here, is a belt-driven machine shop. So starting in the late 1800s with machine shops powered by um, water wheels and then eventually steam engines, um, this was a, another very skilled line of work where, peop where people would have been using machines like these to cut and shape the metal into lots of different products. The machine right here in the front was a lathe and it was used to shape the couplings um, that would attach fire hoses to fire hydrants. Um, we have a comment actually in the chat from Jane Moltrek, who is the um, head of uh, collections at the Museum of Industry. And she posted uh, an answer to the earlier question about um, employee records. And another question, um, how much does it cost to visit the museum when it opens? Uh, for members, it is free. I know that many of uh, the people on the, the call today are already museum members. And if you're not, I encourage you to join for that free membership and other programs like this one. Um, but it is, uh, we have prices depending on discounts and things, but around 10 or $12 uh, per visitor to the museum. Um, I do have another video to show off. I actually have a whole bunch of videos. We'll see how much we have time for. Uh, here in the machine shop. Um, I'll start with a video demonstrating the uh, lathe. You'll see me engage the mechanism using the large wooden lever above the machine. And then the piece of metal that we're cutting and shaping is in the middle of the machine. Uh, and a blade will shave it down to the right pattern. one pass down the piece of metal, uh, the machinist might have to um, reset the blade and let it pass down a few more times to cut the right depth until you have the right threading. Uh, again, this would make couplings for fire hydrants and fire hoses. Um, another machine that I can demonstrate in the video is a reciprocating planner. Oops. Sorry to jump around so much on us there. Uh, which is a machine on the end here. A blade would hang down in the middle of the machine and a piece of metal would move back and forth underneath. And each time the blade would shave off just a millimeter at a time until uh, the piece of metal is at just right thickness. And you'll see the machine uh, move back and forth on its own reversing direction. <laughs> 
as the machine shops in uh, around the same time that these machine shops were emerging, uh, there was a kind of a transition in Baltimore uh, among trade skills like these, instead of relying on um, apprenticeships in maybe a small uh, craftsman shop like a blacksmith shop, instead trade schools and even colleges became an important stepping stone to getting a skilled job in the city like one of these. Um, for partly for uh, reasons related to limited uh, education access, but for other reasons, that meant that um, members of the black community in Baltimore had a more difficult time entering into the machinist trade than they had the blacksmith trade. There are, of course, examples of exceptions and um, have a great picture here from the Library of Congress's collection, um, which shows a black worker at a naval yard um, during World War II using machines like these to, to cut and shape pieces of metal for ships. Um, particularly during the war, there was an effort for the U.S. government. Um, the U.S. government was funding uh, major war, uh, war production projects in cities all over the country, designated different, different companies for contracts, and really stimulating uh, a ton of business all over the country. But there was an effort for the U.S. government to only award contracts to companies that were pro-union and, um, and uh, uh, open to uh, uh, minorities as well, both open to hiring women and hiring people of color. Um, it wasn't universally enforced, and many of Baltimore's companies were criticized by the Afro-American newspaper um, for taking war contracts and then not following through on their promises of hiring black workers. I do know of at least one company that um, was praised by the Afro-American for hiring black machinists, and that was the um, Bartlett sorry, the Bartlett Hayward Company. So they opened uh, a plant in Baltimore during the war and wound up hiring several hundred uh, black machinists and laborers to work in the plant. Um, but they were more the exception than the rule. Um, I have another picture as well coming, this one coming actually from the Baltimore Museum of Industries archives. Let's see if I can Zoom in a little bit here. And this one shows um, a black machinist working on, um, working on, it, it looks like maybe some motors or something. Uh, this, uh, this picture was taken at the Maryland Casualty Company. If there are any questions about the uh, machine shop or any of the photos that I've shown just now, um, then I encourage you to drop those in the chat. And I want to be conscious of everyone's time and not, um, not go on too long here, past what we promised, but there is one more major story that I wanted to highlight. So uh, as you may be thinking of any questions, feel free to, to drop those, but I'm actually going to jump ahead to our last exhibit for today's tour. And this is our print shop. Uh, the printing industry was a vital one connected to pretty much all of the other um, industries in the city. A lot of print shops, like the one that you see here, would have been making their own newspapers and selling them directly. But they also might have been taking um, orders to print advertisements, labels for products, um, brochures, all kinds of other things on smaller contract work. Um, so the print shops wound up being connected to lots of other types of work in the city. Um, the first object that we have here on the end is actually one of the oldest that we have in the museum. Uh, this is an acorn press from the early, from the 1820s. Um, so kind of a, a look at what some of the earlier print shops in Baltimore would have been using but I will actually skip ahead to show a video of a printing press from the early 1900s called a Chandler Press. Um, and if we go around the corner here, we can see that. So a printing press 
for anyone who um, hasn't seen one up close before, it's kind of like a giant stamp. A big part of the printer's job, the printer being the people who worked in the shop, um, a big part of the printer's job would be to take uh, metal letters and arrange them to spell out all the words that you might want to print. Um, so it was a big piece taking the, or that was a big part of the work, taking each piece out of uh, time to load them into the machine. Here the letters are loaded into the middle piece of the machine. The ink is layered on top and a roller picks up the ink and spreads it evenly on the letters, which is what we'll see in the video here. The machine is foot powered, so you can see me running it down below. And it won't actually press, it won't make contact with the paper until I've got it going. Then I can throw a lever, and that will actually engage. Keep the machine going and just slide the pages in and out. So that shows a relatively simple printing press from the early 1900s. Um, this is the era that a major um, black owned newspaper was emerging in Baltimore. Uh, starting in actually 1892, the Baltimore Afro American um, became uh, another major institution in the city. It was founded by this gentleman here named John H. Murphy. He was actually born in Baltimore, but born enslaved in 1940. He fought in a colored regiment during the Civil War. And after the war, worked in a couple different jobs before eventually winding up as a um, printer for the uh, Bethel American Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, Bethel AME. C is still a, a major religious organization in Baltimore, um, and in the the early, in the late 1800s, uh, this gentleman right here, John H. Murphy, was publishing a newsletter for the church. He eventually uh, pulled together the resources to turn that newsletter into a full newspaper company uh, called the the Afro American, and for the next more than a century. Um, the Afro-American was a, one of the largest Black-owned newspapers anywhere in the country, uh, eventually uh, having hundreds of employees and publishing not just in Baltimore, but in other cities in the region as well. Um, we have a photograph, a couple of photographs that I'll run through. Uh, one picture of the editorial staff of the Afro. Um, part of the Afro-American's mission was challenging Jim Crow policies and uh, promoting racial integration and civil rights uh, across Baltimore. Um, so they remain, even today, one of the best sources of information for historians at Maryland's African-American community in the early 1900s, because they were covering things like civil rights protests, um, discrimination by white companies and businesses, and even lynchings, um, issues that white-owned newspaper companies either weren't interested in covering or maybe weren't interested in giving the full story of. Um, the Afro-American does still exist today and is in fact still in under the leadership, at least in part, of John Murphy's um, family. His great-great-granddaughter is um, involved in running the newspaper today. And they have uh, an excellent archive online which you can access uh, through the um, Enoch Pratt Library, Library's website. So you can see all kinds of great articles from the Afro's history. And actually, as one of my coworkers pointed out, which I didn't realize, uh, today is the anniversary of the founding of the Afro-American, which is great. Um, and another picture, this time of the, the Afro-American print shop, where they actually, you can see the cases where they would have stored um, the letters that they would have been printing with. And down here in the corner, you can see what looks like the, the arrangement of uh, some of the letters for the, the newspaper. 
So I actually want to apologize for talking longer than I had promised. Um, as I mentioned, there's a ton of history to share at the Baltimore Museum of Industry. And this was just uh, really a quick breeze through of some of our exhibits. Um, I want to conclude my portion just by uh, saying that, of course, uh, black owned businesses and black workers are not a thing of the past in Baltimore. Um, by one estimate, about half of the businesses in Baltimore today are, owned, are black owned businesses although they tend to be smaller and um, only represent a very small portion uh, of Baltimore's workers. Um, so lots of black business owners, but a fewer uh, proportionally much smaller percentage of black workers in the city. We'll be doing, the Baltimore Museum of Industry is looking forward to doing some additional programming in the next couple months about modern black owned businesses. So I hope that you can join us for that. Um, here is, just a quick plug for some of our upcoming programs. And if you have any questions um, about anything that we've shown on the tour, I'm happy to stick around for the next couple of minutes and do my best to answer those. For everyone, um, I know we're coming up on about an hour from when the program started. So for anyone that does need to join now, or I'm sorry, for anyone that does need to leave now, thank you very much for joining. And uh, we appreciate your time. And we hope that we'll see you again at some of our programs, virtually and maybe on site. Um, and the last plug that I'll do is for our education programs. Uh, these, all, all of our events are posted on our website and our social media as well. So you can see there are lots of places online where you can see about what, what will be coming up in the next few weeks. Um, also more information as we put it together on our public program about black owned businesses in Baltimore. That'll be shared on the website, in our membership newsletter and on social media as well. Um, anyone who knows an educator or anyone connected to um, a group who might want uh, a private tour of the museum it can be for school audiences, for um, senior groups, for adult audiences, um, corporate events. Um, we're happy to do these events uh, privately as well. I don't see any other questions that I might have missed.